Ah, and we are live! Welcome back to Takes by Fans. We have an absolutely great packed show for you today. Be sure to follow me on Twitter at Takes by Fans and be a part of the conversation. And come watch live daily, noon Eastern at twitch.tv slash Takes by Fans or takesbyfans.com slash watch. Whenever we are live, we are live on the website. We are live right now. We are live on the website. Perfect. Bingo, bingo, bingo. Y'all know how it is. All right. So either way, however you, however you decide to watch, make sure you're watching for all your sports content. Oh, boy, do we have a uh, wild show for you today. Uh, we got to talk finals. We have to talk a whole day of NFL football with craziness, literally. The 1 o'clock, the 4 o'clock, the 7 o'clock, the late game. Oh, my goodness, fantastic. Watching our number one pick in our power rankings, the Seattle Seahawks clawing their way back from a little bit of a deficit. They could not get it going offensively early, but, hey, it's Russell Wilson, baby. That's why they're number one. We don't have this team number one for no reason, y'all. It's for a reason, and we'll get into it when we talk that game. Um, yeah, so, and Dak Prescott, oh my, ah, oh my goodness, we'll get into it, we'll get into all of it, um, but first, y'all already know, come on, we gotta talk about the COVID, so let's get this out of the way real quickly, um, some good news, finally, Titans, no positive tests coming in from yesterday, absolutely fantastic, um, this Titans testing team needs to kind of be smooth till Tuesday, we have to get negative tests today, and we have to get negative tests tomorrow, so the Titans bills in Titans, in Titans, Tennessee still goes on without a hinge, hitch or without a hitch. So we get Tuesday night football. I want Tuesday night football, please. I want Sunday. I want Monday. I want Tuesday. I want Wednesday. Wednesday would be the only kind of non football week th- or game this week. We'd have Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, obviously, you know, Friday, but we never have Friday. So we're not missing out on anything. Um, so yeah. Big news here, big good news here, Titans, no positive tests. We need no positive tests to come back tomorrow as well so we can get this uh, game going on the road. Also, Patriots, no new positive tests coming in from yesterday. So once again, fantastic. Patriots not showing it. Um... They are trying to get back into their facilities as well, so they'll have to have one more. If it comes back today, they can try to open up uh, their facilities either Tuesday or Wednesday. So, um, yeah, good news all around so far. No positive COVID cases coming back positive from yesterday. And then we had this giant colossal. I'll try to follow along with this. I've read this eight times. I still can't remember when, who is playing and when they were supposed to and how they're going to play it now. Where is it going? I don't know. But here it is. Uh, Broncos new England the game is going to be played on Sunday October 18th that they were supposed to play this week they couldn't got pushed back because of the positive COVID cases all right then we got Kansas City Chiefs and Buffalo Bills this was supposed to be played on Thursday this was supposed to be the Thursday night football game are we not getting Thursday night football this week I gotta double check into that but um this game was supposed to be played on Thursday. It got pushed back until Monday, um, and this is going to be on primetime television at 5 o'clock. We're getting Monday Night Football, two Monday Night Football games. This one's going to be at 5 o'clock, so th- this Thursday night game gets pushed back till Monday. Um, Jets-Dolphins. Dolphins were supposed to face... I don't know who we're supposed to face this week, folks. <laughs> was it the Titans or somebody? Um or the Bills, but this is going to get pushed back. So uh, we aren't having our regular scheduled opponent this week, so they're moving up the Jets-Dolphins game that was supposed to be from Week 10 to Week 6. So this is who we're facing. And then the Jets and Chargers moving from Week 6 to 11, and the Jaguars-Chargers are moving from Week 8 to 7, one week up, and the Chargers at Broncos is moving from Week 11 to Week 8, and the Chargers at Dolphins is moving from Week 7 to Week 10, and the dolphins Denver's moving from Week 6 to Week 11. So hope, hopefully you cut up. We're never going to be able to memorize this, so we will... We will look at this chart accordingly if we ever need to reference it. It's on my liked. It's by Adam Schefter. If you want to, you know, maybe screenshot this tweet, I'll let y'all do it real quick. Because I, we are not going to remember all this. And I don't expect anybody to remember all this. I will not be remembering all this. So if y'all forget, no worries there. We'll come back to it. But the majority of it is um, the Titans and um, Patriots really kind of screwed up the entire schedule. So we have to shift a lot of games around to try and... Um, make everything right, make sure everybody's playing their games. So a little rearrangement of their schedule, no big deal. Let's all not freak out about it, all right? All right? I know it's fun. I know it's easy. I know it's clout-worthy if you uh, if you go wild on this tweet. I'm sure in the comments it's uh, kind of wild. But uh, we'll, uh, we'll just say on the main topic that uh, a lot of games are getting moved around. 
Um, but that's really all the COVID news. Um, nothing really to uh, to uh, dwell on. Everything's looking good so far. We'll wait till the Wednesdays, the deadly Wednesdays, the deadly Thursdays. We get a lot of news on those days, so uh, we'll uh, we'll keep you updated here at the start of takes by fans on every show. This is what we've this is what we've got to do now. COVID's coming out every day, in some shape or form. So uh, we got to update everybody. Alrighty, let's get into the main action of today, baby. The L.A. Lakers are your NBA champions for the 2020 season. Well done to everybody on the team. Well, I can't even say everybody on the team. I'll say LeBron and Anthony Davis because a lot of these scrubs on the squad were infuriating me literally every time I'm watching them play, just not getting it done, not being consistent. Don't even talk about the Game 5 blunders from Danny Green and Markeith Morris. Oh, boy. Don't even want to see their names anymore. But in in classic LeBron fashion, he carries the trash to the finish line for his fourth ring. Absolutely fantastic. The one bad thing about this game is that it was basically over at the start of the second quarter. I had to switch it off the screen. I had I had it on the big screen here. The Heat Finals or the Lakers Heat Finals game. I knew the Lakers were going to close out, so I wanted to really experience it on the big. I got, what what is this, like 54-inch TV in front of me. I had it on the big screen, but after the second quarter, I'm like, why the heck am I still watching this? Had to switch it to the mini screen, put Monday night or Sunday night football on the big screen, which proved to be a good game, but I digress. Um, so let's get into these highlights right here. We'll show it to you. We'll show you this game was not close, folks. It was not close at all. The Heat knew that they lost pretty much as soon as they stepped on the floor, unfortunately. LeBron was on a mission, and so was KCP and Anthony Davis. I mean, they were putting up the points early off. We'll get into it when we look at the stats, but here we go. Early on, LeBron James going coast to coast for the donk, you know, getting his team hyped. And once again, behind the back, finishes at the rim. This man was going to the rack, man. He was laying it all on the line, getting that early lead, securing the early lead, just going to the bucket. Look at that man. The man's in his 17th year, folks, if y'all didn't know. And he's played an entire, like, two additional seasons based on how deep his playoff runs go. It's kind of wild. So, well done to LeBron James. Definitely earned. Gorn and Dragic back in the game, but I mean, really a non-factor. He didn't start. He wasn't, you know, physically good enough to really kind of start. So they left uh, what their starting lineup was, has been since game one. But he's really a non-factor. He had no real chance to even get his team in. Tyler Hero, we saw this man struggle and struggle early. I mean, we've been saying it all series long. He has not elevated his game from the bench to a starting position. He's definitely going to have to work on that going forward. And I definitely think he will. The man's 20, yo. I'm not knocking the man by saying that. It's just a fact. And he'll definitely grow. This is his first um, NBA Finals, folks. He'll be here again. This Heat team is pretty good. So they could definitely challenge everybody in the East. Maybe not the Nets. But, hey, if they don't have to run through them, sometimes you can get lucky. But uh, this Heat team is definitely set up for the future. But this is the second quarter, folks. I mean, everything was falling. Did you all just see that pa that shot from KCP that fell for some reason? How? And then he's going to shoot it again and hits the three. So, I mean, everybody was just scoring. The Heat only had 36 points at halftime. 36 points at halftime. 36 points at halftime. I mean, we're, we're, the next highlight is from two minutes into the third quarter. Big time jump because the Lakers were blowing this team out. This was not competitive. We don't even need to see anything in the fourth quarter. I know they show five minutes left in the fourth quarter, so we get a LeBron three here. Everybody loves the LeBron highlights. I do too. I'm a sucker for him. But, um, I mean, we see what the uh, what the main narrative in this highlight package is. I mean, we're skipping to like four minutes left in the fourth quarter without seeing anything that happened in the, first, the third quarter because of LeBron James highlights. So, <clears throat> I mean... Non-competitive game. Lakers blew them out right from the rip, basically. And uh, the Heat just cannot get back into it. So, unfortunate for the Heat. A great run. Great playoffs. Great. I, I mean, I've had a ball talking about them. Um, but, you know, they come up short. And that's how it is. There's got to be a winner. There's got to be a loser. Unfortunate for the Heat that they were the loser this time. Um, so, let's get into these stats. We can't really tell too much from these stats because people, I mean, 36 points in the first half for the Miami Heat. I mean, this game was non-competitive, folks. When I say non-competitive, I mean absolutely non-competitive. This was like a team facing the New York Jets, and uh, we could basically compare it to Cardinals versus the Jets this week. I mean, really not competitive. It may seem competitive because the Jets only lost by 15 or 14 or 20, actually. But, um, I mean, really. 
Not even close. We get LeBron James with a big 28 points, 14 rebounds, and 10 assists, finally getting his triple-double that he kind of deserves. We saw him miss out on a triple-double here in the finals by, like, one assist or one rebound, like, two times. Um, Jimmy Butler's got triple-doubles when these games actually counted. Eh, I got to throw that dig in there. I can't be all positive LeBron. I'm sorry. But um, absolutely fantastic. Great closeout game by LeBron. Shot 65%. He only made one three-pointer, but he was just going to the rack. I mean, 20 field goals. 20 field goals. Just absolutely fantastic. 15, not from three. So he was just going to the bucket, driving, driving, driving. Knew he had it laid all on the line. And luckily, his supporting cast really stepped up. Um, Anthony Davis, only 19 points. But once again, I mean, we're talking about they're not even playing at 100% speed midway third quarter on. So we can't even count those last, what is that, 18 minutes of the game? So Anthony Davis, 19 points, 15 rebounds, folks. He was still grabbing the boards, even though the points were a little light um, because everybody else was really scoring and scoring very big. I mean, when have we ever seen this? When have we seen Danny Green get 11, Caldwell Pope get 17, Rondo get 19? I mean, absolutely fantastic. The supporting cast stepping up and stepping up the best way possible, offensively putting up the points. That's why this game was kind of blown out from the get-go. Great defense mixed with great scoring, everybody hitting. I mean, Rondo shot 73%, folks. He shot three of four from three. What the heck? Playoff Rondo is officially here and here to stay. And he just won a ring with the Lakers. Now he has a ring with the Celtics as well. So that rivalry, he's been on both sides. He's the only player in NBA history to have a ring with the Celtics and the Lakers. So, I mean, this man, absolutely fantastic. 30 big minutes, 19 huge bigger points. I mean, fantastic. <clears throat> Kyle Kuzma still trash. I mean, we can't get it all right, right? We can't have Danny Green, Kyle Kuzma, or Danny Green, Rondo, Caldwell Pope all hitting and Kyle Kuzma. That never happens. We never expect that to happen, and it did not happen. So Kyle Kuzma, only two points, 25% shooting. Markeith Morris back with the three points on 25% shooting. Dwight Howard didn't even play this entire game. He got in in garbage time, one minute, three points, and he hit the three-pointer uh, at, really at the last second. It was real, real late. Um, they could have dribbled out the clock, I think, but Dwight was like, no, no, no. I worked too hard uh, to um, not have a, a ring, and I want to get in the game, and I want to score points in this closing game, so that's exactly what he did. Just let a three fly kind of wildly, but it went in. So, hey, we give the man credit. Worked hard all all of his career to get to the NBA Finals only got there once with Orlando, and I think they got swept or lost in five by the Lakers team led by Kobe Bryant, I believe. So, I mean, Dwight Howard comes full circle, finally gets to the um, gets to the finals for a second time here, and he capitalizes it. He had a great two first games. Let's not, you know, he did kind of help this Lakers team get to this championship. Um, he wasn't a key pivotal piece, but he. He did very well those first two games, so we will give this man a little bit of credit here. He definitely deserves a ring, no doubt in my mind. So well done, LeBron getting his fourth, Anthony Davis getting his first, Danny Green getting his second or third? Second? I know he won with Toronto. Did he have one with the Spurs? I'm not quite sure, but he might have his second or third, so well done. No, it's got to be only two because LeBron James is the only player to win a NBA championship on three different teams, so Danny Green did not win one with the Spurs. Um, so... Well done, Rondo getting a second, Kuzma getting his one and only because he will most likely not be with the Lakers next season and he will never get back to the finals the way he's been playing. So well done for LeBron getting giving everybody you know he's so he's so unselfish giving everybody Alex Caruso um Kyle Kuzma Markeith Morris Jared Dudley Quinn Cook all these players rings JaVale McGee gets his second I think because he rode the coattails of another superstar duo Clay and Steph so he's just kind of riding coattails out here along with J.R. Smith so the charity that LeBron James is donating to is NBA players that are not good enough to win a ring on their own that have to ride coattails of superstars. And hey, I'm, I would do the same thing if I was in the league. Yes, I'm playing with the best. Give me the ring. I'm trying to show off the ring, you know, 15 years down the road when I'm 50 and I'm at a party and I could be like, oh, y'all didn't know I was at a championship winning basketball team? Oh, yeah, let's go to the backyard and I could shoot some hoops in the driveway uh, hoop that y'all got that's only nine feet that broke because a tree fell on it and the backboard smashed and the rim's a little bent, but if you shoot it this way, it goes in. But that's what I want to talk about 15 years down the road, so I would obviously do anything for a ring. Don't get me started. Alrighty, let's look at the heat. We're not going to see anything. I mean, oh, excuse me. 
the really thing I really want to focus on is um, just Tyler Hero. I mean, <clears throat> seven points. I mean, nobody had a great game this game. Bam out of bio had 25 points and 10 rebounds somehow. Just kind of unnecessary. Um, but, uh, yeah, Tyler Hero, he's got to step up his game. And I, I, I know he will because the man's absolutely fantastic. Got to work on the threes a little bit. Got to work a little bit better, maybe on his mid-range mid range game just a little bit so he's not just kind of a one-trick pony, pony with the threes. I know he can drive very well. But he's got to kind of kind of has to start creating his own space, getting his own shot, getting open on his own. So he's got definitely some stuff to work on. But what a great season by him! Kind of had to get called up when you know he wasn't ready. Very unexpectedly, Gore Dragic goes out game one. He has to step up his game. Unfortunately, he did not. But I definitely expect big things from this man. He's had a great season. I hope it's not just he caught lightning in a bottle. I hope this man has a very, very good, solid career. But this, I mean, this Heat team, yeah, they're obviously only one piece away. They have to have maybe you know that that number one. I mean, Jimmy Butler has proven that he could be the number one in big time shot in t big time selections. So what do you even see? like one big superstar maybe just one key piece away maybe one more big because we know bam out of iowa is really their only big kelly olenic got in the game but only because the game was out of out of reach but he still put up nine points in 14 minutes that was the big reason and, and he had three offensive rebounds so i really 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 would have loved to see kelly olenic in game number five more that was the big thing why i thought the heat <clears throat> where it just came up just a little short or no the heat won game five what am i talking about um, yeah, because I saw, I said that Eric Spolster was smarter than me, obviously, but yeah, I think Kelly Olenek needs more time in this, uh, in this kind of rotation here. He only got minutes because the game was basically over at halftime. So, but he, he put up nine points in 14 minutes. I think they just need that offense. This is what the heat do. They're kind of, they have to go kind of go out and kind of be maybe like a mini version of the Rockets where they just have to kind of live and die by the three. Obviously this team doesn't need to live and die by the three, but the three is a huge part of this game or this team's game. And they really didn't shoot it a lot um, in the finals, which I think may have been their downfall. So I would have liked to see Kelly Olenek a lot more minutes, games one and two, which they've lost. Maybe here earlier in the rotation and game number four, try not to rush Goran Dragic back too much. Him being out really just kind of ruins the chemistry. I mean, the Heat have been, you know, competitive games two through five without Goran. I really thought it was kind of a mistake. They didn't play him. I, I think he got in late first quarter when the game was still kind of close. But I think I would have held off on really playing him. Um, I think Kelly Olenek should have played more. But uh, Bam Adebayo with 25. Jimmy Butler with 12. Jay Crowder with 12. Tyler Hero with only 7. Duncan Robinson with 10. I mean, uh, no, uh, they didn't put up enough points total to make this kind of box score look even decent for a loss. But... This is how it goes. LeBron with his uh, fourth rank, three with uh, different teams. And LeBron's really b kind of been consistent here, winning his rings. Um, when he went to Miami, first year, not so good. But the second year, won a ring. So by year two in Miami, got the ring. Comes back to Cleveland, makes it to the finals year one. Year two, gets the ring. Now he goes to the LA. Year one, gets injured, can't make the playoffs. Year two, ring. So, I mean, wherever he's going, expect by year two. I mean, things take a little bit of time to develop and process. You're in a new team, new system, new players. How do these players react? None of these players has ever played in the finals, finals before. Most of them. I get it. Rondo has and uh, Dwight Howard has. I get it. I get it. I get it. But, you know, LeBron has to, you know, teach these players and l develop the chemistry and the rhythm and how do these players play well under pressure. Oh, they've never been in a playoff series before. Well, now I have to take the time to kind of, you know, teach them, okay, this is what you have to look forward to. Don't fall into this trap. A lot of young players fall into this trap. Don't do it. I've done it as well, but I've seen a lot of people do it. Don't do it. All right, y'all haven't played a game seven before. Okay, let me teach you how to play a game seven and don't, you know, expend all your energy in the first quarter. It's a, it's a, uh, it's a marathon on a sprint let's relax oh you guys haven't even played in the finals before all right so here we go game one this is what you expect game two every game's different in the finals but we have to just stay together all right now it's a closeout game we're up 3-1 folks how do we close out oh they can't another game so <clears throat> i mean this these things take time to really develop and the fact that lebron is only taking two years is really really something special and really competitive year one as well i mean heat they got to the finals year one i think when he returned to Cleveland, I think they got to the the finals year one against the uh, Warriors. So I think, the, you know, he's going to the finals 
Yo, year one with new teams, it's really fantastic, and he's winning, and he's winning rings by year number two, folks. So this man is truly great. I think he's the goat. You can argue with me. I really don't care. I won't argue back. The argument is tired, folks. I mean, Skip and Shannon literally talk about it every single day, folks. Every single day, every single year. So, um, you know, I think greatness. It, it literally gets better with every gen every every generation. The athleticism approves. The IQ approves. The game changes. So, I mean, yeah, in 20 years, I'll be talking about a new goat. I mean, we can't. I mean, are we talking about? Are we still going to be talking about? You know, the goat of Jordan. You know, 50 years from now you know when he played in you know the 90s like come on let, let's be realistic the athleticism changes the game changes the sport changes it's changed um here again so i think we got to declare lebron the goat he is in my eyes and we will move off the topic <laughs> um so well done to the lakers i'm not sure what i'm going to do with the cash and trash list just quite yet for the nba I think I'm just going to leave it up as kind of like a uh, like a Hall of Fame kind of cash list. We got to take Duncan Robinson off. We got to take Jimmy Butler off. We'll leave Anthony Davis and LeBron James on. I'm I'm actually going to put Rondo on here as well. So well done, Rajon Rondo, getting on the cash list one more time. I believe you're on here a little bit, but well done. I'm going to put you on here. Just getting on here on the last available day, but that's the only one. I may put case. Should I put KCP on here too? He had a great game. What what a closeout. I mean, 19 point 19? What do you have? 17. I mean, I got to put it on here. If you're scoring 17 points on this Lakers squad, you got to be on the cash list. So we'll we'll fill it up a little bit. Well done. We'll put, we'll put uh, KCP up here. So I think we'll just kind of have this on the website for basically until basketball season starts again. We'll make this kind of like a Hall of Fame list. So well done to LeBron, Anthony Davis, Rajon Rondo, and KCP. The, uh, the cash list MVPs of the 2020 season. Fantastic. Um, we could take some players off the trash list. I won't leave these player, these poor players on the trash on the trash list the entire year. Make it like an infamy, like a uh, yeah, an infamy list. Just uh, just leave them on, <laughs> just leave them on the trash list the entire season, the off season. Uh, although they should. Danny Green put up 11, so I can get forgive him a little bit, but not Marquise Morris. But we'll, we'll take them both off here. They both got rings. They're obviously doing better than I am, so uh, we'll take them off. Um, yeah, so well done. Congratulations, LA Lakers. Congratulations, LeBron. Get that respect. You damn well deserve. I loved it. I loved it. Um, all right, let's get into the NFL. Now we've got a ton, a ton, a ton to talk about. Let's, we got to go through every game. It's Monday, folks. We have to get a qu like a quick understanding, building the groundwork through the week. So Tuesday, I mean, Tuesday, we really can't even do our power rankings because we have a game on Tuesday. Although I will forgive it. And I will, uh, should we move it to Wednesday? Well, we'll talk about it. We'll talk about it. But today, we de definitely just got to talk about all the games in general. So here we go. Let's run through them. We'll start here with Carolina and Atlanta. In Atlanta, man, Dan Quinn got fired. Dan Quinn got fired. Thank the Lord. I mean, obviously, I don't want to see anybody lose their job, blah, blah, blah. But, I mean... 0 oh, and 5, you have a chance to win. I mean, you put up no, po you put up seven points in the first half, but it was basically on your first drive that was scripted, and you knew what you wanted to do, and you executed it very well. But then, I mean, you let Teddy Bridgewater catch fire, and now he's up 20 to seven going into halftime, and then you start building momentum in the third quarter here. But then, what happens? But then what happens in the fourth quarter when you're only down seven and you're marching and you're on Carolina's five-yard line? Matt Ryan interception. Matt Ryan interception blows the game, blows the blows the win because, you know, he wants to see Dan Quinn fired. So, you know, Dan Quinn, I would be looking at uh, Matt Ryan be like, you son of a bitch. You got me fired because you want to throw an interception on the five-yard line. And Arthur Blank, the owner of the Falcons, he could not wait. He was down on the field. <laughs> he was down on the field like two minutes before the game ended, waiting to fire Dan Quinn. D no, no, no. You don't need to go to the locker room. The exit's <laughs> the general public exit is this way, Dan. Why don't you Why don't you take that way out? But um, he gets fired. It's deserved. Unfortunately, he's got the funk about him. He blew the two leads this uh, this uh, the season. He blew the. Super Bowl lead, unfortunate. They're 0-5. He's kind of ruining good talent. I mean, he's got Julio Jones, and the man doesn't have a ring, kind of what Calvin Johnson made. He, he retired early from the league because he was good getting nowhere with Detroit. Arthur Blank trying to save Julio Jones in Atlanta for a couple more years, at least, so he has to get rid of Dan Quinn. It's a good decision. I don't know where he goes to coach. I mean, which team needs a coaching 
coaching job? Who, who, who's got a coaching vacancy? Not the Chargers, not the Saints, not the Bills, not the Titans, not the Bucks, not the Bears, not the Panthers. Falcons obviously just came from there. Not the Bengals. They just got a new head coach. Not the Ravens. The Jags could be a good spot for him, definitely. Um, they're going to definitely get off of Doug Monroe at some point. I don't know when it comes, but it will come. You got to rebuild that franchise. And what better way to do that with a new coach? I mean, you got to really just go from the, the coaching staff to the players. You got to start something in Jacksonville. Texans, I don't think it's a great fit for him. Uh, because he is a more defensive-minded head coach, and they've got a ton of pieces offensively. So I think they kind of changed up Bill O'Brien, I believe. Was he defensive? He kind of seemed defensive to me. But, um, yeah, I think they go for offensive coach in Texans in Houston. Uh, Raiders, no. Chiefs, no. Cardinals, no. Jets, yes. That's going to be a coaching vacancy anytime now whenever they want to pull the trigger. Um is it a good fit for Dan Quinn? It's going to be a tough fit. It's going to be a tough rebuild fit for Dan Quinn. I mean, he's already got the record of not being good. So going to the Jets really could just put a huge black mark on his coaching resume. But maybe he could turn it around. Maybe. I don't think so. But somebody's got to try. <laughs> um, definitely can't go to the Eagles. Not going to the Steelers. Not going to the Rams. Not going to Washington. Not going to Miami. Not going to San Francisco. Not going to the Colts. Not going to the Browns. Not going to the Giants. They just got their new head coach. Not going to the Cowboys. They just got their new head coach. Not going to the Vikings. And not going to the Seahawks. Not going to the Patriots. Not going to the Broncos. Not going to the Packers. Not maybe could go to the Lions because I think Matt Patricia by the end of the season or in the off season he gets fired. The Lions could actually be a really good drive. Kind of once again rebuilding, moving on from. Matt Stafford, if Dan Quinn can pick his own quarterback, kind of take advantage of this defense that the Lions has kind of proven that it is all right. It's not the best, but they've got some good workable pieces. The Lions could be a nice fit for Dan Quinn. <clears throat> I will officially endorse this. The Lions, you got to get rid of Matt Patricia. It's time for him to go. You kind of have to move off of Matt Stafford as well. So I think you make the change in this offseason. Get rid of Matt Stafford. Get rid of Matt Patricia. Bring it in. Kind of start a, a kind of... Um, an already started rebuild, um, but I think Dan Quinn can definitely fit in with the Lions. I think that's where he goes, but not a lot of spots opened, unfortunately, for Dan Quinn. Just a couple of spots, Houston, Jets, Lions. Is that what we decided on? But, um, yeah, Dan Quinn gets the boot, unfortunate, um, but, I mean, we called it. We called it. Him and Bill O'Brien had to go, uh, but Dan Quinn had an extra couple of chances to save his job, and he never took advantage. Truly, truly unfortunate. Um, as I said, Matt, Ly Matt Ryan blew the blew the game basically. Um, <clears throat> Ted, or Carolina didn't look great until they let up. Uh, was it this touchdown? Let's watch this one real quick because this really changed the entire momentum of the game. A 57-yard pass down the sideline. I mean, this was nothing great. I mean, it was just the speed of, I believe this is Robbie Anderson. Not Robbie Anderson. More. Look at him go just right down the sideline. This literally changed the entire aspect of this game because Car or Atlanta was forcing Carolina into only settling for field goals. Now they open up the scoring. They get a touchdown here. Their next drive, they get another touchdown. They're up 27 going into half. Atlanta starts to come back a little bit, but once again, they have to settle for field goals. And once they get to the five-yard line, I mean, they're holding Carolina to punting so far. So they're getting great. Um, they're putting up the points, and they're stopping Carolina from scoring. Make it a one-score game, but Matt Ryan throws an interception on the five-yard line. And the game was going so fast in the second half because because Atlanta was just running the ball, running the ball, running the ball, eating up the clock. This game ended about like 15 or 20 minutes before even 4 o'clock. So that's how fast this game went. And he throws an interception at the 5-yard line. Teddy Bridgewater just basically runs out the clock all the way down. I mean, they get this ball at 8 minutes left. And they don't give it up until 1 minute left. So they held it for a 7-minute drive. Atlanta could not get them off the field. And they lose the game. Uh, Matt Ryan, 21 of 37 for 226 yards. No touchdowns in the pick, obviously. Um, Calvin, or not Calvin Johnson, Julio Jones did not play. But Calvin Ridley, I'm telling y'all, this offense should be fine without Julio Jones. Calvin Ridley goes for 136 yards, but they really had no number two. So I guess Julio Jones did, in fact, um, kind of play a key role because they had nobody else to go to. Their second leading receiver is a running back, Todd Gurley. You know how I feel about that. If your number one or number two receiver is a tight end or a running back you're kind of limited offensively we'll talk about that narrative going through this entire week because I've got more to say on it um, <clears throat> still not sure how to feel about this Panthers team I mean they're scoring the ball Teddy Bridgewater is looking good 27 of 37 313 yards two touchdowns no picks in Mike Davis oh my goodness Atlanta could not stop him all 
game long. 16 carries, 90 yards, averaging 5.5 yards a carry. Literally just bullying him right up the middle, carrying it for 5 to 7 yards. Nobody could tackle this man. It took literally like 4. We'll try to highlight that on a Wednesday when we do our film review. But uh, Mike Davis literally could not be brought down. It took literally the entire 11 men of Atlanta to bring him down. So that was fun to watch. I will, I will say that. It was a great running game. And, you know, they had a great passing attack too. I mean, we're looking at Robbie Anderson and DJ Moore, both two. I mean, these are wide receiver folks. These are not tight ends. These are not running backs. Their top two receivers were actually actually wide receivers, and they both basically had 100 yards receiving. 112 for Robbie Anderson. DJ Moore with 93. We saw him just in the highlight right there with the 57-yard huge game shifting touchdown so well done to Carolina they're figuring out ways to win Matt Rule might have to start giving him a little bit more credit um, but we know he's good in the regular season it's just kind of you know in the bowl games is a little trouble so we will wait to the playoffs to really fully judge this man but he's got his team to three wins on a you know without Christian McCaffrey so I got to definitely give some respect to that man he's doing all he can in Carolina Teddy Bridgewater showing out you know some of these games two touchdowns no picks I can get behind it Alrighty, let's move on. Um, <clears throat> all right, here we go. Next game. Cincinnati and the Ravens, and I thought Cincinnati would put up a little bit of a, a better fight, but they basically put up no points. I mean, their field goal came um, last second, literally. Um, we're talking about <clears throat> how much time left on the clock. 37 seconds. <laughs> 37 seconds, and they decide just to get some points on the board to make it look at least a little competitive, but we're talking about a 27 nothing blowout folks and you do you know how hard it is to let a team score zero points in the nfl it is very 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 hard folks so i got to give a ton of credit to john harbaugh this uh this ravens defense just putting putting the hurt on the Bengals. they could not do anything um we've been used to seeing joe burrow throw throw for 300 yards well he threw for 183 <laughs> 19 of 30 183 yards, no touchdowns, and a pick, so not great. A little bit of uh, maybe not too much of dink and dunk, but not airing the ball out, unfortunately. Um, then we saw Joe Mixon. He had himself a great game, two touchdowns, like 100 yards last week. Kind of got wrapped up a little bit. They didn't abandon the run, 24 carries, so they were just kind of they were like, all right, it's going to go, it's going to go at some point. It just never did. It's like when you're pulling that lawnmower, you're pulling it, you're pulling it, you're like, it's going to come sometime. And then five hours later, the wife's like, why the fuck is the the grass not mowed? And you're like, my good and get it going, unfortunately. Um, so Joe Mixon, 59 yards. He only averaged two and a half yards of carry, folks. That running game was getting shut down. And the receivers, well, they got they got nothing. 62 yards by a T. Higgins. And then Tyler Boyd, a tight end. He's a tight end. Pretty sure. Almost 100% guaranteed. He is a tight end. 42 yards. And then they're, so two of their three leading receivers, tight end. Running back, not the best, not the best. Got to have receivers, actual receivers, to take attention away from your offense. Um, if you're running the ball and throwing it to them, they're just going to key in the running back. If you're throwing to your tight end every time, they're going to press up and double the tight end and make you throw to a receiver. But you haven't gotten your receiver in rhythm because you've been dumping it off to your tight end and running back the entire game. So now you're, you're, you're not doing good. Um, Lamar Jackson didn't have a great game either. 19 of 37, not the best, really not the best. 180 yards, two touchdowns, a pick, just kind of, it just kind of worked. The defense really saved the day, only allowing three points. But um, that's kind of what we've been seeing from Lamar Jackson a little bit. The yards by passing are quite not there. I mean, we got to see at least 200 yards of passing a game. We have to. I really don't know how you win in this league without throwing for 200 yards. Um, it's just their defense because they allowed zero points from Cincinnati. So really no pressure from Lamar Jackson this entire game. And he played like it. Only 100, 100 yards um, passing. Um, but just look at this. I mean, Mark Ingram, I mean, they didn't run the ball a lot, but they got effective yardage. We're talking about Mark Ingram, 11 carries for 57 yards. And then look at this, De Devin Duvernay, one rush, 42 yards. And D K J.K. Dobbins, one rush, 34 yards. So they had some great, great plays that kind of set up a little bit. Um, the one, I believe, set up this touchdown play. Is this correct? No. It set up the this touchdown? No. I don't know. We'll get into it more on Wednesday when we look into this game a little bit more. Um, but, yeah, definitely those great runs by, I mean, 
This is what the Ravens do. They've got running back by committee. Mark Ingram, Devin Duvernay, and J.K. Dobbins are all very – and Gus Edwards even. And he rushed seven times for 25 yards. Um, I, I, I don't think Devin Duvernay is a running back, actually. I think it is Gus Edwards. Let me check. Yeah, he is a wide receiver. So that was a trick play by Duvernay. I apologize. He is not a running back. I didn't think so. I thought it was Gus Edwards. So, um, you know, their running back by committee is absolutely fantastic. Absolutely love it. So one thing I think the Ravens do better than the Chiefs when you compare I mean, everybody compares them because Lamar Jackson, Patrick Mahomes, I, you know, you have to a little bit. So I do like Ravens running game better than the Chiefs running game because they do it by committee and they're all very good, whereas Chiefs only have Clyde edwards Alar basically. So um, very well done by the Ravens. They get the win, but it's kind of a classic Ravens win. Defense not letting Lamar Jackson do too much, and he didn't do too much. Um, just, I mean, Joe Burrow just cannot get anything going. This entire Bengals team cannot get anything going, unfortunately, and they lose because of it, and they put up no, no points. I'm not even counting this, folks. I'm counting the official score as 27 nothing. And, I mean, what does the field goal do here anyway? You might as well just go for the touchdown. You're on. Wh where are you guys? It's 4th and 7 on Baltimore's 20. Why not just go for it? What's the point of the field goal? To build some momentum going into this next week? I'm not buying it. If we kick the field goal, I'd be more upset. I would rather score zero points <laughs> and try to score a touchdown. Um, but that's the Ravens. Bengals, I thought the Ravens or the Bengals would be more competitive. Unfortunately, they weren't. Uh, uh, Baltimore trying to rein it in a little bit. Hey, look at us. We're putting up points, and we only allowed them three, but basically zero. Hey, come look at us. I know we lost a lot of attention when we lost against the Chiefs, but please come look over here because, you know, Lamar Jackson thrives off of that. He thrives on being, you know, the center of attention, and that's not a knock on him. That's just, I believe, you know, it fuels him more. So, um We'll see what happens with the Ravens, but we definitely got to keep an eye on the stat line. Only 180 yards passing. Got to keep an eye on it. All right, let's move on. Texans and Jaguars and the Texans. They get rid of their coach last week. They're playing free, and they put up 30 points, the most points that they put up this season, and why, I'll tell you why. Um, look at look at these pieces. We know we knew this Houston offense is good. We know they've had pieces. We love their running game. We love their receivers, and look what they went and did without Bill O'Brien. Well, David Johnson, 17 carries for 96 yards, five and a half yards a carry, fantastic. Using your weapons, and they didn't stop there. Look at this receiving core, folks. Don't get you know too starstruck by Brandon Cooks, eight receptions for 161 yards and a touchdown. We got Will Fuller, four receptions, 58 yards. Darren Fells, two receptions, 57 yards. Randall Cobb, six receptions, 47 yards. Kenny Stills, one reception, 14 yards. They're one, two, three, four, five. They're top Five receivers are all actual wide receivers. That's what makes this team dangerous. That's what makes this team gifted offensively. The running game is there. The wide receiving core is there. We're talking. Look at these receivers: Brandon Cooks, Will Fuller, Darren Fells, Randall Cobb, Kenny Stills. I mean. None of these receivers are A1 tier, but these are all A tier receivers. Fantastic. These could all be number one receivers on a not fantastic team. Do you, he, they're, it's not a Kelvin Johnson. It's not a Julio Jones. These are all just very, very solid. These are all like Kelvin Ridley's on the same field. So, I mean, these are all great talents. Randall Cobb, Kenny Stills, Brandon Cooks, all great talent. And they finally utilize them all. They utilized them all. I mean, look at everybody getting involved. Everybody. Everybody. And David Johnson took care of the running game on his own, which he usually does. So, great game by Houston. Loved what this team could do. Now, Deshaun Watson, 25 of 35 for 359 yards, three touchdowns. Let's all marvel at that before I reveal the bad news, which is two interceptions. Not great. Got to clean those up, definitely. But I love what they're doing here. They're playing free, they're playing loose, and they're playing to their weapons, which is what you should be doing in this league. Play to your strengths, and your strengths are your offense. So go up and put up 30 points. That's what you should be doing, especially in this league where there's somebody scoring at least like 40 points every single week, like multiple people putting up 40 points. We'll talk about it when we get to the Chiefs-Raiders game because that game was a fucking shootout. But Houston... Finally getting back on track here. This is what the team should have been this entire season. So Bill O'Brien, I think we can officially report that he was holding this team back. This team hasn't put up 30 points at all this season. They had the opportunity to do so last week when they were at home. Two weeks ago, whenever they were at home last, um, they had the opportunity to do it there. They do it here, and they do it very well. And now we can start buying into Houston a little bit more, playing loose, playing free, playing to their strengths. Gotta love it.
Um, all right, let's look at Gardner Minshew. I mean, the Jags are truly not good. We got Gardner Minshew going for three, 31 of 49 for 300 yards, basically right on that 10-yard um, per throw mark, which is where you want to be. Two touchdowns, no pick, but he did fumble. They did have trouble fumbling the ball. Um, who fumbled? It was Gardner Minshew lost it and James Robinson. So, you know, you're running back, your quarterback fumbling. Who can you trust, really? I mean, you got to start having wide receivers catch the ball in the backfield. Is that what we got to do? Um, but let's take a look at these turnovers because they both did commit two, but uh, Houston took advantage more. So their first, we got the um, interception by Deshaun Watson in the second quarter, but the, uh, the Jags don't cash in. They miss a field goal off that turnover. Unfortunate. <clears throat> um, then they get a interception. Again, Deshaun Watson's second interception coming in the third quarter. What do the Jaguars do with it? They fumble the ball, and the Texans take advantage of it and go down and score a touchdown. Um, then, uh, the second fumble coming in the fourth quarter. And once again, Houston takes advantage of the turnover, the, the sudden change of offense to defense. They take advantage of it and they score a touchdown. So Houston able to score 14 points off turnovers where Jaguars were able to score zero. That's the main story of the game. We're talking about, you know, a 14 point swing here, a 28 point swing. You had 14 for Jacksonville. You take 14 away from Houston. And now this is an entirely different game. So definitely. Houston has to clean up those turnovers. We can't have Deshaun Watson. He maybe played a little bit too free because he didn't have, you know, a coach that he had to kind of, you know, check himself under. So Deshaun, clean up those interceptions and it will be good. I assume he will. I, you know, this was kind of, you know, the first game with the substitute teacher. You can do whatever you want. Then he starts, you know, the substitute teacher starts to implement a couple rules here and there to kind of gain some control of the squad. Everybody kind of reigns it in a little bit and they perform better. So I expect the Houston to this Houston squad to still be very good. And I expect Deshaun Watson to cut down on these turnovers a little bit. And be a little bit more, um, more of a powerhouse. So we'll keep an eye on Houston going on this week and uh, the weeks to come. Alrighty, we got to talk about it. Chiefs getting their first loss of the season. They're my number two team going on the power rankings uh, coming into this week. So we are going to have to drop them off a little bit. Who's going to take their spot? That's yet to be determined, but I've got some ideas. Um, but we've got the Raiders winning 40-32. to Now, this legitimizes the Raiders' offense. Not so much their defense. Their offense is good. We saw them kind of get a little star starstruck with Darren Waller a little bit, their tight end. Um, but they cleaned it up this game. Darren Waller is now their third leading receiver. Something I can get behind. Henry Ruggs, actual wide receiver. They're number one. He put up 118 yards. Nelson Aguilar had a very good game too. Uh, two targets, two receptions for 67 yards and a touchdown. We can definitely get behind that. Darren Waller, five receptions, 48 yards. Now, I will say they did target him a lot. He had seven targets. So going to their tight end a little bit too much in my opinion. I feel like you should be using your tight ends you know, third and ones, kind of we needed an extra yard or two, not with how Tom Brady uses his tight ends where we're going to drive down the field using our tight ends and then our receivers in the red zone. I don't think that's how you win games. I don't think that's how you win games consistently. So uh, I think the Raiders found a perfect balance for Darren Waller a little bit here. Obviously, Henry Ruggs is a huge addition or back from, uh, I believe he was injured for maybe the last two weeks. So a huge addition back to the squad and he made him pay 118 yards on only two receptions. Also scored a touchdown. Um, let's focus on Derek Carr a little bit real quick. 22 of 31. 347 yards, three touchdowns, one pick. I mean, this man was letting it rip the entire game. You're looking at 22 completions for 347 yards. That's something truly fantastic. You're not dinking and dunking. You're letting your arm do your work. You're letting your receivers go out there and do what they do. That's what he did, and they were able to put up 40 points because of it. Absolutely love this offense now. I think we could start buying the Raiders a little bit more um, offensively still. I mean, they still gave up 32 points, and that may not seem like a lot because it's the Chiefs, but you still gave up 32 points, and your defense was kind of in that bend-but-don't-break scenario late in the game where the Chiefs come down and score, and then they get the two-point conversion, and now you know that 16-point game turned into eight points real, real quick, but the defense kind of stepped up at the end. Did they have a turnover on downs? Oh, they just ran out the clock. So, th once again, their offense winning them the game. The defense gives up a touchdown in the two-point conversion. And only the, the Chiefs went eight plays, 78 yards, in a minute and 30 seconds. That's not great closeout defense. Um, and they give up the two-point conversion. 
but then the offense comes out and then they pick up the first down to really ice the game so once again the Raiders offense we can definitely buy and we can definitely fall in love with but the defense definitely needs some work and I don't know if we can trust this defense in big time spots all right let's look let's look at the Chiefs again um, I mean, they've been in this scenario before, down in the fourth quarter, and they still looked cool, calm, collected. Unfortunately, they just could not get that big stop on defense to give the goal, to give the ball back to Patrick Mahomes in the key spots. Truly unfortunate. But he went for 22 of 43, not the best. I mean, we're looking at 50% here, folks. Not great. Uh, 340 yards, which is absolutely fantastic if you can move the ball down the field quick, which they've shown us that they can do time and time again. Absolutely fantastic. Um, two touchdowns, one interception. Not the best. We got to clean up those interceptions. You know, you want to be two to one, but two to one gives you a you know a chance to win the game. Anything more than two to one, you're looking at a pretty much solid win. Um, Clyde edwards Hilar did not do great this game, but they kind of abandoned the run a little bit. Only 10 runs for Clyde edwards Hilar for 40 yards. Um, and then Patrick Mahomes rushes six times. Tyreek Hill rushes three times. Daryl Williams only rushes once. So only 11 yard or 11 carries by actual running backs. They kind of had to abandon the run. The scoring was getting out of hand and they had to keep up. So they were like, Patrick Mahomes, hey, we can't run the ball no more. We got to get there quick. We need quick scores. We need you to do that. He did that just a little too late, which is kind of what we've been seeing. Remember that Chargers game in the fourth quarter finally started to click, brought them into overtime, and they were finally get the win, finally able to beat the Chargers, but it took overtime to do so. So sometimes this offense catches its stride a little later than you would hope, but they still find it somewhere, and uh, they still give you a chance to win every single week. All right, Tyreek Hill, I believe, is one of the best two wide receivers in the league. The sheer speed of Tyreek Hill is truly incredible to watch. I mean, there was a touchdown that should have went for, I think, about 60 yards that got called back, but it should have been a touchdown for Tyreek Hill. The, 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 just his the speed is truly insane to watch. So I think he's one of the best ty or wide receivers in the league. I'll tell you the other one when we get to it. Haven't got to it yet, but I have said it. So if you know, you know, and we will reiterate it when we get there. Um, yeah, not too much that we can watch for. This is a game we are going to have to kind of dive deep into in our film study on Wednesday. So we won't dive too much or dwell too much on this game because I kind of this is kind of a game we have to see to believe just because of the high scoring and the big plays. So we'll get more context watching the game than we'll, we will get from just analyzing these stats. So let's move on to Cardinals Jets. I mean, did anybody I, I, I actually saw people on Twitter being oh saying, oh, so it's not just Sam Darnold. No, Sam Darnold is the best piece on this team. Nobody was saying that you have to change the quarterback. We have to change the entire culture. We have to change the coach, the general manager, and every supporting cast piece of this Jets team. We don't have to get rid of Sam Darnold. Nobody said that you have to get rid of Sam Darnold. At least I thought. I didn't think anybody thought Sam Darnold was the main problem of the Jets team. It's Adam Gase, and it's their lackluster. They're trading away all their good players. They got rid of their best player defensively Jamal Adams in the offseason so they're getting rid of all their pieces they have no pieces so to think that you know Joe Flacco would come and magically somehow win you games uh, I don't know what people are thinking but people are thinking wild stuff out there, out there on Twitter so be careful what you be careful what you see out there um Cardinals kind of back but a still little red flag I have to bring up so they get the win, they put up 30, and they only hold the Jets to 10. Fantastic, that's what every team has been doing against the Jets. So the Cardinals are right on par, and they're back to winning. But, 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 um, Kyler Murray, 27 of 37, 380 yards. I can definitely get behind that. Touchdown, interception, I cannot get behind that, though. Um, Kenyon Drake, he rushed pretty well, 18 carries for 60 yards. I can get behind that. Not great, but it's 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 average. It's three yards a carry. It's ground upon, and you really didn't abandon it too bad. 18 carries, you know, that's 18 rushing plays, folks. Come on. I can get behind it a little bit. Um, what? But once again, who's their main receiver? DeAndre Hopkins. Got to try and figure out more players to get the ball to. Uh, you can't just keep going to DeAndre Hopkins. I get that he had, you know, Christian Kirk. Is he? He is a wide receiver. Chase Edmonds is the running back. So they're, you know, the receivers are kind of getting it done. I can get behind it a little bit. Christian Kirk with 78 yards, but DeAndre Hopkins, seven targets, 131 yards, trying to once again force it to him, maybe a little bit, 
more than they should be. Got to find other receivers to get to that number one spot. We need alternatives. We can't just keep going to DeAndre Hopkins. And the fact that they had success once again going to DeAndre Hopkins against the Jets team means that the Jets don't watch any game film at all on Arizona because that's all we have been saying. They're forcing the ball to DeAndre Hopkins. He's having 100 yards receiving. He's having, you know, a ton of targets. I will give him credit that they cut it down to only seven targets. Remember, they were getting up to like 15 targets for DeAndre Hopkins. Hopkins those first couple games and that's why I was a little concerned about this team maybe they're just a one-trick pony but um, they have to find other people to get the ball to Larry Fitzgerald finally had seven targets so I can finally get behind that Christian Kirk here with seven targets very well done for 78 yards so not too bad overall but we got to start figuring out DeAndre Hopkins can't just he, he just can't be the only one putting up the yards right so we'll see how they do it he's the only receiver with the touchdown their rushing game had did pretty decent. Three rushers, Kyler Murray rushed one, Chase Edmonds rushed one, and Kenyon Drake all rushed one for touchdowns. So well done to the Cardinals. We'll keep an eye on them there, though. Still don't know how I want to feel about this game. I thought this was going to be a big kind of, all right, my eyes open. This is the true Arizona team. Are they the 2-0 team that started? Or they are the 0-2 team that happened the last two weeks? But then they go to the Jets and didn't really confirm anything for me. 30 points, which is good. Kyler Murray still throwing interceptions on this Jets defense. We have to look into that a little bit more. So we'll save that for the Wednesday film study. Um, we don't even have to talk about the Jets. Well, Joe Flacco, 18 of 33 for 195 yards. Touchdown, no pick. Okay. And let's focus. All right, let me say this. Uh, Le'Veon Bell. What do you think you want to do when you come into this game with no receivers and a backup quarterback that's old and proven nothing in his entire career besides stealing $100 million from the Ravens? What would you do? Well, I would take my best rusher who finally came back healthy this week and probably rush him 25 times. The Jets don't do that because Adam Gase doesn't do that because Adam Gase does not play to the strengths of his team, which would be Le'Veon Bell. And he only rushed him 13 times. He got 60 yards. I will give him that. But, I mean, basically every every team we've just talked about rushed more than 13 times. Kenyon Drake rushed 18. I'll go through all these games real quick again. Clyde edwards lot rushed for a 10, but that's close. Josh Jacobs, 23. Uh, David Johnson, 17. James Robinson, still 13. Right what Blay Van Bell did. Mark Ingram rushed for 11. Joe Mixon, 24. We've got Todd Gurley. I know he rushed for more. 14. Just one more. And Mike Davis for 16. So, I mean, other teams that have actually good offenses and good quarterbacks and good receivers, their running backs are still only rushing 13 times. So what the heck are the Jets doing? I don't know. They don't win the game. They only put up 10 points. They're still not looking great. They're still looking not good. I mean, look at these first couple drives by them. I mean, we get three and out, three and out, five and out. Turnover on downs. I mean, we can get behind this one. 14 plays, 70 yards, and it ate up eight minutes of the game. But it still ended in no points. And they try to go to Le'Veon Bell up the middle, but they have no play for it. On fourth and one, you run Le'Veon Bell up the middle and don't get it. Mm, not great. <laughs> not great at all. They turn the ball over on downs. Interception leads to a field goal. Other than that, they're not looking great. Three and outs. Six plays that go 74 yards ends in touchdown. I like that. But once again, a lot of punts, turnover on downs, couldn't make the clutch plays, unfortunately. Alrighty, moving on. Eagles, Steelers, and the Steelers are finally back. We can finally judge them again because they couldn't play last week because the Titans got COVID, unfortunate. But the Steelers are back and they're still as good as they were, folks. I might move this team up to the number two spot. I might leave leapfrog them, leapfrog them over the Packers because the Packers are on the bye this week. I might put Steelers as the second best team in the league. And I know what you guys might be thinking. Oh, but they only won by, what is that, nine points? This game was not as close as the score indicated. This Steelers defense was absolutely wreaking havoc all game on the Eagles. Eagles just had a couple of explosive plays that ended up able to score. And so that's, you know, a little concerning that, you know, the Steelers can fix up, but it's not long drives that they're getting blown out on. It's just one play that maybe, you know, a little miscue on defense that happens to the best of them. So we're not penalizing Pittsburgh too much. Um, also, this game, it just kind of like would not end. How I talked about the uh, the Carolina-Atlanta game ended like 20 minutes before 4 o'clock even hit. Um, this game 
it just would not seem to end. I mean, we'd get turnovers, quick scores. So the Steelers are putting up a ton of points. So that's leaving the Eagles a ton of time. And, you know, everybody's backing off because, I mean, look at this fo- look at the score, folks. I mean, we're talking about 31-14 in the second quarter, or in the, or in the third quarter, I mean. So, I mean, this game was a blowout. This was, should be really what the final score was. The game was kind of over at this point. This The defense was crushing. The offense was unstoppable. They were scoring a lot. So... I mean, don't look at the final score of this game. Just look at what the Steelers did all together. So let's start with them. Ben Roethlisberger, 27 of 34 for 239 yards. It was a little dink and dunk game, but he made the big throws when he needed to. Three touchdowns, no pick. I mean, this is exactly what we wanted to see from Big Ben. This is what makes Big Ben different from Phillip Rivers. Kind of similar career um, in longevity. And kind of, um, you know, both in the AFC, both getting the playoffs. But Big Ben, he can step it up. He doesn't turn the ball over, which Phillip Rivers does. And that's why we love the Steelers team. Um, Also, he has a ring. Two rings? One ring, I believe. One ring. Um, One? He might have two, actually. He might have two rings. But either way, he's getting to Super Bowls where Phillip Rivers is not. Phillip Rivers turned the ball over. Ben Roethlisberger does not. Absolutely fantastic. Um, their running game, James Conner, 15 rushes for 44 yards, not great, but they had Clay, Chase Claypool, and ooh, man, this went, man went off. Seven receptions, 110 yards, and three touchdowns, three, four touchdowns, actually, because he had a rushing touchdown as well, so they were just going to Chase Claypool, and that's what makes this team so dangerous. I mean, look at these good receivers, Chase Claypool, who just put up four touchdowns, and they still have Juju Smith-Schuster, and they still have James Washington, and as their tight end is Eric Ebron, an old, reliable Eric Ebron, fantastic tight end. So this offense is still very good. And now let's get in their defense, folks. Let's get into what they did. Well, we had Steven Nelson pick off Carson Wentz two times, two big times. So well done there. And they were just pressing. I mean, three and out, three and out to start the game. And then, you know, they were on their way to three and out again. But... But, unfortunately, on third and nine, I mean, Miles Sanders somehow went for 74 yards. So, just a breakdown defensively. But, other than that, we're looking at three straight three and outs that, um, you know, um, Pittsburgh was able to kind of score 14 points in that same, you know, time that the Eagles had it. So, we're looking at 14-7, but really should have been 14 nothing going into the second quarter. Um, Eagles kind of caught a little bit of fire off that one play, but then the Steelers kind of shut that down again. They get the field goal and the touchdown, so now they're up 10, and then that's when the interceptions start for Carson Wentz, and now they're down 31-14, to 14. and now Carson Wentz, you know, he's, the defense isn't pressing anymore. He can kind of let it fly a little bit more, so they do. So they kind of cut the lead back to a little closer. It's now 9 points, still 2 possessions. Um, Steelers have to punt. Eagles take advantage. Steelers start to fumble, start to turn the ball over, but what do the Eagles, Eagles do? Just unclutch. They missed the field goal would have um, actually had the lead at that point. Steelers, they, you know, they don't miss twice when start when things are not going their way. They get it right back on track because Mike Tomlin, the leadership of him, the leadership of Big Ben, Big Ben gets everybody back into it. They go down, score a touchdown, and now Carson Wentz, he goes and throws interception. So this game is not as close as the scoreboard would indicate. I would really put it at a 34-14 win, a 31-21. I'll give them that. But really, you know, 10 plus points, that's a blowout in the NFL, folks. Anything more than one possession is really kind of a blowout. 10 points, I'll I'll call it a blowout. Love the Steelers, absolutely. Game not as close. I watched all this game, folks. This game was not as close as the score would indicate. Um, oh, we had to talk about Carson Wentz because he did throw two interceptions. Classic Carson Wentz. <clears throat> All right. He did uh, 20 of 35, 258 yards, two touchdowns, two picks. I mean, the yards and the touchdowns came because they were down by multiple, I mean, three scores at one point. So you got to score. You got to kind of score quickly, which they do. Miles Sanders, he had 11 carries for 80 yards, but I just said 74 of those 80 yards came off of one play. So the Steelers, Steelers were shutting down the run. They could not run the ball at all, and they picked off Carson Wentz twice what more do you want from the Steelers team um you know Steelers defense can't help the fumble they could help the 74 yard rushing play that wasn't the best but hey you know it happens sometimes so not the best by uh, Carson Wentz as we've seen and uh the Eagles are now what are they they third place now in the uh third or they might be second because of that tie but either way the NFC East is not looking the best (laughs) not looking like the best uh division 
All right, let's move on. Rams in Washington. Once again, I thought Washington would be a little bit more competitive in this game. Um, Ron Rivera makes the choice to bench Dwayne Haskins for Kyle Allen as Dwayne Haskins was getting better. He wasn't turning the ball over last week, so I thought that was a good sign, but Ron Rivera obviously knows better than I do. So they start with Kyle Allen. He goes 9 of 13 for 74 yards and has the team looking good. I mean, they had the lead at one point. At one point. But, um, you know, they got kind of shut down. Alex Smith comes in for the rest of the game. Kyle Allen kind of, he got tweaked a little bit on a play, so they bring in Alex Smith. And they Kyle Allen was good to go back into the game, but they kind of just rock with Alex Smith because it's a great story. And the game was kind of out of, hand, out of hand anyway, but he doesn't do anything. 9 of 17 for 37 yards. I mean, do we really expect anything from Alex Smith? Mid, you know, getting thrown halfway into the game with no kind of real practice or the the staff the snaps with the number one I mean Kyle Allen was named the starter going into this game so Alex Smith he wasn't working with the ones you know doesn't have a lot of experience with the playbook you know actually you know going out there you know yes he's reading it because he had two years off what more are you gonna do right so you know he knows the playbook but he hasn't had the repetition with the starters not building that kind of um, the rhythm with the receivers and not building the chemistry. So Alex Smith, he's still not the starter. We're still rocking with Kyle Allen going into next week. I don't think that's really great. He didn't do the best when he was in, but he did all right. Um, nothing that Dwayne Haskins couldn't do, in my opinion. Dwayne Haskins could put up 10 points at home. Absolutely, absolutely. But what happened in the second half, that's where the things took a turn. So it was a little close in the first quarter, first half. Um, we'll look at, uh, let's talk about the Rams and then we'll get into kind of the meat and potatoes of what happened in this game. So we get Jared Goff, 21 of 30, 309 yards, two touchdowns and a pick. Definitely can get behind that, especially what game they had last week against the Giants and they were at home for it. So well done. The offense getting back into a rhythm. Remember they only scored 17 points last week. So they bumped that up to 30 on the road. Definitely fantastic. Now we can rebuy into the Rams. We had to take that, um, t take that kind of deep, in deep breath in. Are, are the Rams actually good? But this is week five. You know what I said about, you know, the first first quarter of the season being over. This was a huge week. The Rams putting up 30. Great sign there. Everything was going very pretty well. Um, 61 yards by Cam Akers. Daryl Henderson struggled a little bit carrying the ball. 15 carries for only 38 yards. But Cam Akers had a decent day. And running back by committee gets you over that 100-yard mark. Basically, that's where we want to see it. Um, Cooper Cup and Robert Woods, both great. 71 yards for Woods. Cooper Cup with 66. So the offense is getting back on track. But what happened in this game? Well, Washington stalled, and they stalled huge, folks. I mean, we're talking about a close game going into halftime. We're talking about 20 to 10. 10 point game for Washington. That's a huge win against a high powered Rams offense. But what happened in the second half? Well, Washington could not get a first down. You heard that correctly. Let's look at their drives. Three and out. Three and out. Three and out. Turnover on downs. Four plays. So they didn't pick up the first. They couldn't pick up fourth and two. They couldn't pick up fourth and two. Alex Smith. Pass incomplete. Unfortunate. Um, three and out. Three and out. Three and out. They literally picked up no first down in the second half. No first down in the second half, Washington. What the heck is going on? You couldn't pick up 10 yards ever? Wow, 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 wow. That's just great Rams defense shutting it down. I mean, we talk about um, the Ravens defense basically allowing no points against the Bengals. Well, let's talk about Rams allowing no first downs in the second half against Washington. Absolutely fantastic defense by the Rams. Once again, this Rams defense, I'm big on them. I mean, you got beef down low, and you got great corners uh, back there with uh, Jalen Ramsey. Aaron Donalds is obviously the beef I'm talking about. Um, nobody... They didn't. Washington never turned the ball over. That was surprising. So well done to them. Kind of holding on to the ball. No interceptions. I mean, when you're playing with Kyle Allen and Alex Smith, his first game back, and they throw no interceptions, that's a good silver lining to build off of. But I don't think the offensive firepower is just there. They're trying all their quarterbacks. But, I mean, when you don't have very good receivers or very good running games, it just doesn't work. And it just didn't work. And it's not going to work. They have to get more weapons. This team is not great. Chase, um... Chase Young played. Let's see if he had an effect. What did he do? He get Chase Young, no sacks. He had a tackle for loss, so I will give him that. Um, one sack in the game in total made by Montez Sweat. 
So well done to him. But overall, Washington, I thought they would be a little bit more competitive. I thought Kyle Allen would be a little bit better than what he was since, you know, Ron Rivera, you know, had the audacity of benching Dwayne Haskins, who was, I thought, in my opinion, was getting better. And I've been shitting on Dwayne Haskins since week one. So the fact that I'm saying that, I thought it held a little bit of weight. But I thought Kyle Allen would come out here and sling the ball. He did take an injury, which kind of messed up the rhythm. So we'll see how he does next week. Once again, a Washington quarterback where we're giving passes every single week, which leads to seasons with Dwayne Haskins coming into this season. So when will they ever figure it out? I don't know, but it's not going to be soon. All right, let's move on. Dol- Dolphins 49ers? What else do we got to talk about besides the defense, folks? Oh, my goodness. This, this Dolphins defense made Jimmy Garoppolo sit the second half. Called it because of, you know, the line wasn't protecting him well. We beat the 49ers so bad defensively that um, – who's their head coach? I can't remember his name. Damn it. Um – Damn it. I can't even remember. The head coach of the 49ers, he had to make an excuse to get Jimmy Garoppolo out of there because it was over at halftime. We were up 30-7 to going into half, folks. 30-7. 30-7. 30-7. On the road with the 49ers starters getting all their pieces back. We're talking about Debo Samuel. We're talking about Jimmy Garoppolo. We're talking about Mostar, Raheem Mostar, all coming back. And they put up seven points at halftime with Jimmy Garoppolo. So he gets benched. And then they put up ten points besides then. And, you know, we're still scoring. We're still scoring good. We're moving the ball. Touchdown, field goal. One punt, field goal. So we had the ball four times in the second half, and we only punted once. And we had the ball how many times in the first half? One, two, three, four, five. We had the ball five times in the first half, and we only punted. Oh, no, I missed an entire. Look at this. Touchdown, touchdown. On our first two drives, again, we're scripting plays. We're sticking to the game plan, and it's working. It's working, and it's working to perfection beautifully. Up 14 nothing. Game's over at that point. Defense puts the pressure on. Let's see how well this defense did, shall we? All right, here we go. Jimmy Garoppolo, two interceptions. And what happened on those interceptions? Well, we cashed in three, and then we cashed in three again. So six points off turnovers. Obviously, you want to see a little bit more, but we're talking with 24 seconds left on the second interception, literally right before halftime. And we are, are able to get another field goal out of it. So we'll take it. Um, then we had CJ Beathard. He fumbled. And what happened on that fumble? Well, it's the end of the game. <laughs> so we didn't cash in too much on the turnovers. But just defensively putting up the pressure. Only allowing San Francisco with 17 points. 7 points in the first half with all their starters. Sorry, yes, their offensive line is not good. I get it. But we took advantage of it, and we pressurized them, and they did not look good. And now we're 2-3 and three in the AFC. We just put up 43 points. I got to give credit to Fitzpatrick. I didn't think he would be good this game, but he went 22 of 28 for 350 yards, trusting our receivers. I love our receiving core so freaking much. Uh, we got Preston Williams, who's been emerging this season. Absolutely fantastic, 106 yards and a touchdown. We got old reliable when he's healthy, Devontae Park. Parker, um, absolutely love that man. Big receiver who will go up and get the ball. That's what he does. 50 yards and a touchdown. Mike Gesicki, our big tight end. He was our second leading receiver. You know how I feel about it, but I'll make the excuse because it's because <laughs> it's the Dolphins. But he had an ex- excellent game, an excellent catch, 91 yards, five receptions. So well done to him. Everything was just kind of clicking for us. Plus, we stuck with the run game. I mean, uh, Gaskin with 16 carries for 57 yards, and then Matt Breida, you know, he came from 49ers, so we had to get him into the game. He rushed nine uh, nine times for 20 yards, so we're still running the ball. We were still passing the ball. We never abandoned the run. We were up big. We still run the, ran the ball, and we were still doing it, passing the ball as well. So everything was really clicking offensively, defensively for the Dolphins, and we're a real squad, y'all. We are a true squad. We were building the winning culture last year. We won like our last like three games, folks. Come on. Give us a little respect. Um, still rocking with Ryan Fitzpatrick because he does, you know, he does have these games. The Fitzpatrick, that's why he has the name because he does it, right? So we do get the good games from Ryan Fitzpatrick, but then we get the not good games, the interception games, the multiple interception games, the multiple interception games where he throws interceptions in the worst spots, like a Matt Ryan does last week in the, you know, on the five yard line, throws a touchdown or throws an interception when you're down seven on the five yard line, having a chance to potentially tie the game or cut the lead down to four. 
score with the t- with the field goal. So, you know, he has those games, but we get the Fitz Magic game, so I can rock with it. I think we do still have to make this switch from Ryan to Tua. I mean, Ryan's not going to be here next year, folks. It's just not going to happen. We're not going to say Tua two years. That's unprecedented. It's not going to happen. So, I think, you know... With, um, you know, building, you know, if we're building for next year, we have to get Tua into the game, you know, not just in garbage time, you know, when, you know, if we were down, you know, you know, 09, you know, if we were 0 and 9 heading into week 10, then we start Tua. It's just like he's getting no great experience. He's not knowing how to win games when you're a good team. He's learning how to win when they're a bad team and we're not supposed to be bad next year. So we got to get them some experience. So I want to see Tua really sooner rather than later, even though Fitzpatrick is having these Fitz magic games, they don't last. He's really 50, 50. He'll have the good game. He'll have the stinker. He'll have a mediocre game that really could be up in the air. Then he'll go back to the good game. Then he'll go back to the bad game. And then once again, that kind of mediocre game setting up the big game. So we've seen this time and time again, folks, let's not get, you know, confused by it. Let's not get hypnotized by this fantastic game that he had. Like he did have, on Thursday Night Football, and then what happened last week? Multiple interceptions when we had a chance to beat Seattle. So I want to see Tua in, even though Fitzpatrick is winning. We've got to make the switch. This is about building for next year, but we have to give Tua some great um, great experience when we're 2-3. and three. Hey, Tua, go out there. This is your team now, but we expect you to win. Because we're two and three. Fitzpatrick was winning. You have to continue the success. Get that experience. I really don't see the downfall of starting him. If he gets injured, he's gonna get injured. Injuries happen. You can't you can't bench a player just because you fear he's gonna get injured because now you're wasting time. You're just postponing an injury that would have occurred at some point. We have to know if we have to move off of him, if he can stay healthy. We have to test all of that. We can't wait till year three and then decide. Like Dwayne Haskins is literally going to ruin Washington's franchise because they're still waiting for for him to be good. So don't want to fall into that trap. Want to see Tua to play. Want to see him to play. Not going to focus on the 49ers. They did nothing. Jimmy Garoppolo gets benched because they couldn't protect him. 17, 7 of 17 for 77 yards. No touchdown. Two picks when he was in the game. So he wasn't doing anything. They don't bring in Nick Mullins. You know what I said. <laughs> they would have ate Nick Mullins alive. So they had to bring in C.J. Beathard. Who had decent game. 9 of 18 for 98 yards and a touchdown. But still can't win the game and you're not you're thrown in there you know at halftime when your starting quarterback who's good couldn't stay protected so they're just basically like "Eh, good luck (laughs) good luck cj please don't get injured we hope you don't he didn't um all righty yes we called this game absolutely fantastic colts browns we know what this colts team is we can't trust philip rivers we really can't even trust baker mayfield either I mean, I was kind of right exactly about how the Browns play, how they uh, how they win playing, and kind of the Colts were the same way. They don't trust their quarterback to go and throw it 35-plus times. They don't think they can win like that, and what happened, both of these quarterbacks did it. They did that. Um, Baker Mayfield threw it 37 times, and Phillip Rivers threw it 33 times. So, they, they you know, this was trying to win by the quarterback and that does not really fare too well the only reason why the Browns won was because Baker Mayfield is at least competent when he's throwing 37 times he throws two interceptions that's why I say if he throws it a lot of times if you're only looking if you're only going to try to win by Baker Mayfield winning you the game and not splitting it up having your run game take a full carry load because Baker Mayfield he turns it a ball over same thing with Phillip Rivers so Baker Mayfield 21 of 37 247 yards two touchdowns two interceptions the the touchdowns really saved this man and hurt the Colts because the Colts had the similar stats 21 of 33 243 yards no touchdowns two picks so once I mean we're seeing it here and we've been saying it if you're trusting Phillip Rivers if you're trusting Baker Mayfield I don't know, maybe Sam Darnold as well in that same category. If you're throwing the ball 35-plus times, they're going to throw the interceptions, and they usually don't always throw the touchdowns with the interceptions. We know Phillip Rivers doesn't. We kind of know Baker Mayfield doesn't either. But Baker Mayfield did go 1-1 to touchdown interception ratio. That's why they win this game. Close game. But Baker Mayfield's able to throw the touchdowns. Um, really no trick plays kind of this week to set up Baker Mayfield for a short field. So he just had to go and win it on his own. And he kind of did. Uh, Kareem Hunt had a decent game. 20 carries for 72 yards. Averaged three and a half carries. Uh, averaged three and a half yards per carry. That's average in the league. If you're getting three yards a carry, that's average. Anything more than that, we can be you know grateful for. 
Uh, but he, what does Baker Mayfield do? He trusts his wide receivers more this season. Jarvis Landry, four receptions, 88 yards. Odell Beckham, five receptions, 58 yards. Austin Hooper, their tight end, five receptions, 57 yards. Now, it's just not about the receptions. It's about the targets, folks. Baker Mayfield was targeting his actual weapons. We get Jarvis Landry targeted nine times. Odell Beckham Jr. targeted nine times. Austin Hooper targeted ten times. We're talking about 30 targets between their main three wide receiving weapons so I love to see that that's what Baker Mayfield does that's what Kevin Stefanski wants to do get the ball to the playmakers Bayfield or Mayfield do that and they did it and they win the game because of it so well done um I didn't you know get all the nonsense that Kareem Hunt wasn't wasn't going to be able to help the Browns and the Browns running game was disastrous now because Nick Chubb was out. Everybody forgets Kareem Hunt. He was part of that Chiefs team that was absolutely fantastic. The man's got great speed. He was a great rusher for them. He just domesticated violence. So they had to sit him out for a little bit. <laughs> so he's rejuvenating his career, getting back to where he was. 72 yards rushing, no rushing touchdown, but he also caught he caught a touchdown. Three receptions, 21 yards, and a touchdown. So we can definitely get behind that. Now let's look at the Colts. Phillip Rivers throws those interceptions. And what happens on those interceptions? They threw a pick six. <laughs> he threw a pick six. Yeah, so that's seven points cashed in for the Browns. And then the second interception was... Uh, the Browns turning it right back over to him. <laughs> so well done. Um, so, But they still cashed in a pick six. That's huge. I mean, when we're talking about a nine-point game, really could have won either way, but that pick six secures seven points for the Browns that the Colts did not or could not get because Phillip Rivers cannot throw touchdowns. The arm is looking weak. He looks like he can't push the ball down the field. It's unfortunate. They don't have a lot of weapons like the Browns have. They have T.Y. Hilton, folks. T.Y. Hilton. He's been there a while. He's not the freshest. So um, we this is Colts team is exactly how I thought it was. I can't buy them. I can't believe in them because Phillip Rivers, he's turnover prone. He's careless with the ball. He really just looks like he doesn't care. If you watch him play, like he throws the ball. Like he doesn't give a fuck about going to like winning a ring. He's just like, all right, this is my job. I throw the ball for my job. If I, if I throw an interception, that's not on me. That's on y'all for hiring me because this is what I am. So don't like the Colts. I absolutely love the Browns. This win here, this Colts defense is pretty good. I'm not going to lie. I do like their defense. I think the defense is the best part of the team. Um, I think Philip Rivers hurts them a lot more than he helps them. So Philip Rivers facing their finally good team that they face. This is the hardest competition they've had to face all year. Vikings, Jets for two weeks straight. I mean, come on. They're, what are you doing? You're not proving anything. So Col uh, Browns here with a good defense of their own. Picks off Phillip Rivers twice and doesn't allow him to throw any touchdowns. That by you know this was a huge game for the Browns, huge game for the Colts. The Browns win it. They win it more convincingly. So we absolutely sell the Colts and we start buying this Browns team. If I can fit them into the top ten, I definitely will. And there are there may be some spots able um, open. So the Browns they might be in the uh, the top ten. Don't be surprised. Alrighty, moving on. Two games left, and then we are out of here. Stay, stick with us, folks. We are almost done. But, um, yeah, man, oh, man, oh, man. Man, oh, man, oh, man. Was I right about this game, or was I right about this game? And we have to talk about Dak Prescott getting injured. So let's uh, let's talk about these stats, and then we'll talk about uh, we've got the injury queued up. I mean, everybody likes to say they don't want to see the injury, but, I mean, don't we want to see? I know, I know we don't want to because it's hard to look at, and this is a man's career, but aren't we just curious by nature? We have to look. We have to look, right? If somebody says, yo, don't look behind you, your first instinct is to say where, right? So we've got the injury queued up. If you want to watch it, we're going to show it. If you don't want to watch it, it's going to be shown, so look away. But I will, <laughs> I will warn everybody because it is, it's not the best. It's really, truly... Woo! All right. Uh, but before we do that, here we go. Giants, Dallas. We know J Dallas is not good defensively, and we know that the Giants are not as bad as their 0-4 record coming into this week would suggest. We've seen time and time again, literally every week on our Wednesday film study, we're looking at a Daniel Jones potential game-winning or game-tying field or touchdown drive attempt. Now, he's not clutch, but that doesn't mean he's trash. Daniel Jones is actually pretty good. He's I, I'm, a, I'm a believer in Daniel Jones. It's just unfortunate. Saquon Barkley goes down. They don't have the best weapons off Offensively, I mean, their top receivers are Darius Slayton. Golden Tate's pretty good. 
Evan Ingram is a very, very good uh, safety blanket at the tight end position. But, I mean, they don't have, like, a true number one receiver, and it's unfortunate. Plus, his running back goes down. So, Daniel Jones, he's not trash. He's just not clutch. We can't confuse the two. There's, you know, there's really just being a serviceable quarterback and then being an above-average clutch quarterback. But we've seen Daniel Jones drive down long fields, throw interceptions, or not able to complete the process of scoring a touchdown late in the game. We saw it last week against the Rams. We've seen it other weeks. He just, he just, he's just not clutch. It's, uh, it's unfortunate. He might be able to learn to be clutch. I don't know if that will ever come. But um, you know, he's a very solid quarterback who can get you in game winning game tying positions late in the fourth quarter where every team wants to be. Unfortunately, he can't capitalize. So the Giants make it a very, very competitive game. I mean, folks, we're talking about 17-3 Giants at the end of the first quarter. Why? Because Dak Prescott throws the pick six, because they're able to drive down the field on their first touchdown, looking good. Scripted plays by Jason Garrett. Revenge game for Jason Garrett. He wants to prove that Dallas shouldn't have been fired. I tweeted out live that Jason Garrett, after this pick six by Dak Prescott, Jason Garrett's probably thinking to himself, he was never throwing pick sixes when I was, you know, the head coach. Hey, but y'all do y'all. Y'all wanted to fire me, so this is what you get now. Dak Prescott throwing pick sixes, throwing out the leads, fumbling the ball. All of that has been shown in these first five weeks. Not great. But, yeah, competitive game all the way throughout. We're looking at 24-20. Dallas finally gets ahead going into half. But, um, you know, Giants are sticking with it. They're sticking with field goals. Once again, this is kind of like that clutch gene, just not able to kind of extend the plays deep into the red zone. When we're on the goal line, we have to settle for field goals. They do it here. But, uh, you know, they make it a one-point game. Dallas comes back with a touchdown. Um, then, you know, the Giants, once again, come back with a field goal. Then they fumble because of the deck, or no, then they fumble and then they capitalize with a touchdown, but then the Dallas comes back and then Andy Dalton leads them on a game winning field goal drive. So well done to Andy Dalton to step in, but let's, you know, quickly close out what we've been saying about the Giants. So Daniel Jones, 20 of 30. 222 yards, no touchdowns, no picks. That's what we know. He doesn't throw a lot of interceptions, but when he does, they're usually in clutch time spots. Doesn't throw a lot of touchdowns, and they definitely never come in clutch time spots. So the yards are there, the completion percentage, it's a lot of, you know, all right. It's a lot of average, but he's not clutch, and it sucks. Uh, Devontae Freeman had a pretty, actually, really good game. Um, stepping up big. This is kind of like what I like to see about Todd Gurley and Devontae Freeman. They're good running backs. They just need a change of scenery. Maybe just got too too tired some of the organization. Devontae Freeman comes from Atlanta and needs a backup here. Now thrown into the starting role because Saquon Barkley is out. And he had a pretty good game. 17 carries, 17 carries, 60 yards, and a touchdown. Very, very good. Solid game. And then we get um, Todd Gurley, who just needed a change of scenery again. Let's go back to this Atlanta game. Um, but 14 carries for 121 yards, folks. So this man was getting it done. These running backs are good. They just need a change of scenery. Just sometimes you don't fit into the organization anymore. Fresh start. And these running backs are proving very, very good. So promising futures for Devontae Freeman still and Todd Gurley still. And I love to see it. So great game by Devontae Freeman. Um, Darius Slayton, I mean, he had 129 yards receiving. Absolutely fantastic. But just kind of a drop-off. They only really went to him. Second leading receiver was Golden Tate. He was targeted five times. He only put up 42 yards, though. So trying to get it to Darius Slayton, their number one receiver. All right, let's go to the Cowboys now. We know that Dak Prescott got injured. We are going to show it. But 14 of 21, 166 yards, no touchdowns. Kind of that slow Dallas offense that we've been experiencing these last five weeks. And I think, I mean, they have pieces, folks. They have offensive pieces. We're talking about C.D. Lamb, Michael Gallup, Amari Cooper, Ezekiel Elliott. There's no reason why Dak Prescott should be having no touchdowns. And he played until the third quarter, folks. He did not get injured until this drive, I believe. Seven minutes left. Yeah, seven minutes left in the third quarter. So he basically played basically the entire half of the game, more than half of the game. And he wasn't putting up any touchdowns 
passing. That's got to change. These slow starts really hurt him. The pick six really definitely hurt him. Um, Andy Dalton steps in, 9 of 11 for 111 yards. Like, we knew Andy Dalton would be a serviceable backup quarterback, no doubt. He was able to kind of, you know, kind of be that 8-8 eight and eight quarterback with the Bengals, try to get to the playoffs, just can't get you over that playoff hump. But he's he, he can win you games, no doubt. He gives you a chance every single Sunday to win games. He's an 8-8 eight and eight quarterback, 9-7 and seven career quarterback. So we knew Andy Dalton would kind of step in here. And, you know, we were excited that he was getting a backup spot because he would have been kicked out of the league if he was not a backup. Backup. He's not a starter in the league anymore. Now he has to turn starter. This is the perfect situation for Andy Dalton to have success, and I think he will continue his success. He's going to get full time practice from the ones this week. So nine of eleven for 111 yards, no touchdowns, no picks. Could definitely be elevated more these next couple weeks, or really the rest of the season, because Tack is out. He's out, out, out. Um, Ezekiel Elliott, pretty good game. 19 carries, 91 yards, two touchdowns. Feeding the man because, you know, Dak Prescott's out. So let's get some rushing touchdowns to build up his confidence because we are really going to be switching from a pass first team to a rush first team for the rest of the season. Um, that's no knock on Andy Dalton. That's just Ezekiel Elliott is now your best player on your team. So you, uh, you play to your strengths. Hopefully Mike McCarthy does that. He's proven so far he doesn't do that. He didn't do that with Aaron Rodgers. We've seen Aaron Rodgers, the success he's had in the end, the tail end of his prime these last two seasons with uh, Matt LaFleur. So looks like, uh, look like uh, I just lost the name. I just lost the name. The head coach for the Cowboys. Um, I forgot my point now because I forgot the name. Uh, but Aaron Rodgers, he's having success. Um, Mike McCarthy is holding back this Cowboys offense. I hate to say it. They're they're late. They're starting games late. They're not getting good, good points early on. First quarter was absolutely t a terrible for them. Once again, those slow starts we've seen. Then Dak Prescott goes and throws 500 yards. Unfortunately, he gets injured, so he couldn't do that. But that was kind of the route that was going on until the in injury. So... I mean, we knew the Giants would be competitive in this game. We liked um, we liked what Daniel Jones has really kind of shown us. He's not clutch, but it'll put you in positions to be clutch, and that's what we really, really we asked for, not getting blown out. Close games in the fourth quarter. How is it going to play out? So Dallas is able to kind of just get that last second drive. Very good. I mean, we know the Cowboys offense is better than the Giants offense, so they should be scoring more points than them. And uh, unfortunately, Daniel Jones, he didn't have a chance. He didn't have a chance to uh, to win the game, unfortunately. We've seen it. This may be his, you know, this would have been his drive with a minute left. But, uh, you know, they couldn't get that, that first down to really ice the game, unfortunate. Or to send the game into overtime. Alrighty, let's look at the injury. It's queued up. It's all ready to go. Well, it was until it just uh, refreshed on me. Is it going to go back to this play? Nope. Damn it. Darn it. I had to queue it up and everything, but we can find it real quick. I know where it is. I've memorized the play, folks. <laughs> I've memorized <laughs> Dak Prescott's career ending play. Here it is. Alrighty. Let's get to it. Here we go. Oh, boy. Oh, boy. Oh, boy. Let's go full screen. Let's go big time screen. So, Dak Prescott. Here we go. Let's break the play down a little bit. Um, they're up one. Driving into the red zone. Designed run, it looked like. And he goes. He tries to get a little bit more than he wants. And he bends his foot. And bra bra bra. I just saw a worse angle that I didn't even know existed. Here we go. Look away, look away, obviously. Um, spoiler alert, trigger warning, whatever I got to say now. But here it is. Let's slow it down. Dak Prescott right here. It's going to be his right foot. Just gets caught. And look at the way it turns. And we are looking at a backwards foot, folks. We are looking at a backwards foot. Look at this foot. Do you think it should look like this? It shouldn't. Oh, my goodness. Dak, we are like prayers up for Dak, obviously. I think the Cowboys need to pay him. The, the You need to pay the man. He just sacrificed his body to win you games. They were up one, and he, did, he took the ball nine yards on a rush play by a quarterback. The man was laying his life on the line for y'all. Y'all got to pay him. Unfortunately, Jerry Jones is going to have to pay him now. He's going to have to. But look at this foot, folks. Look at this foot. Look at that foot. That should not be doing that. Dak Prescott knows. He's in shock right now because um, he, he, he was not looking in pain. He was holding up his foot. That's now 90 degrees angles, and he has no control over it. It's just limping. It's hanging off his body. He knows. He's like, oh, the foot. 
The foot's bad. The foot's 90 degrees holding it up. He shows no pain. Look, look, he's not crying, which he was, and I, I would be crying as well. He was screaming. He was crying. He's not doing it here. Pure shock. You really hate to see it, folks. Such a promising quarterback. Leading the league in passing yards. Trying to get that great contract. Dak Prescott still trying to hold it up. He's like, nah, this shit ain't coming back up. Oh, my goodness. The bone there. Oh, man. Man. Look at it. Now it's starting to kick in. He's like, Jesus Christ. My foot is 90 degrees. My foot, my foot is perpendicular. This is not good. And he knows it's not good. I believe that's Gallup. Andy, Andy Dalton getting fucking, I don't know what's going on. They're, they're having to, like, plug this man in. Is, is this man a robot? They're, like, putting the batteries into Andy Dalton, getting ready to play. And then just the absolute class. The absolute class by, um, oh, my goodness. Oh, I'm forgetting his name again. The head coach of the cow or the offensive coordinator for the Cowboys now, once head coach for the, or the Giants now, the offensive coordinator for the Giants, once time head coach for the Cowboys. Jason Garrett, to look at the absolute class, he comes over. Dak, you good, man? Fuck, this was my quarterback. I still got love. I still got respect for this man. So love to see that by, um, I forgot the name again, <laughs> so I won't say it. Um, just absolute love the respect, but man, Dak Prescott, obviously play, prayers up and we want a speedy recovery, although it's probably not coming speedy enough. So we'll see. Hopefully this is not career ending. Hopefully he can get back to what he's been doing because he's, he had a promising future truly and it sucks. It truly does. Unfortunate, but Andy Dalton's a good serviceable quarterback. Not too much to worry about Cowboys fans. Obviously we're going to get the drop off from Dak to Andy Dalton, but I mean, with the division you guys are in. The NFC East is truly not good. Andy Dalton is probably still the best quarterback in the division. Hate to say it. So nothing to truly kind of freak out. I mean, obviously you're going to freak out because you just lost your starting quarterback, but it could be a lot worse. Andy Dalton is not. Is probably the best backup in the league. Tell me one other backup that's better than Andy Dalton. I don't think you can. Jameis Winston? But he's going to throw the picks. Andy Dalton, you know, he, he's still serviceable, so. We'll see. All right, that brought us to the Monday night game, and we'll try to run through this one quickly because there's not a lot to talk about until we get to the second half. But, um, yeah, so we let's just look at the drives real quick. I mean, the Seahawks just could not put anything together. It was raining. It was pouring. The old man, he was also snoring, and that's really what affected the uh, the Seahawks. I mean, we're talking about an eight-play drive that ends in a punt. When eight-play, 43 yards. What what the heck? A new punt? And we we're really not used to seeing that by Seattle. We're seeing long drives that ends in at least field goals. But then we get a five and now a three and now I mean they really only had two three possessions here in the first half you can't even count this last one the two plays for 10 seconds you can't count that so just long drives by the Vikings look at the six minute drive 10 minute drive so they were eating the ball and that's how you beat these kind of high powered offense teams the Kansas City with Patrick Mahomes Baltimore with Lamar Jackson Seattle with Russell Wilson you keep them off the field and the Vikings did that in the first half I give this this team credit what a great game plan drive the ball down the field rush the ball nothing big nothing over the top just methodically eating up the clock they held the ball they held it big 16 minutes that's an entire quarter they held the ball 50% of the time and then you know Seattle the five minute drive that ends in no points that hurts you as well because you're taking time off the clock so now we're talking about 10 minutes 10 minutes where the Vikings and the Seahawks really kind of split the ball in the second quarter but nobody could do anything with it Vikings get a field goal to end uh, basically the first half, but then the Seahawks start to wake up and they go and score three <laughs> touchdowns. They forcing they're forcing turnovers. The bend but don't break of the Seattle defense. What I love so much about it, um, they were getting beat in the first half. They come back and they're forcing turnovers. Fumble leads to touchdown. Interception leads to touchdown. Now they're in the game. They've got the lead, 21-13. Kirk Cousins he goes on a drive to kind of make the make the game a little bit more manageable but they don't get the two-point conversion unfortunate 
it. Um, but then the Seahawks struggle again. Seven play, 35 drive that once again ends in a punt. And Kirk Cousin go and leads them to a 26-21 um, to 21 lead now with the touchdown. But then they get the – but then Russell Wilson throws an interception, and we haven't seen a lot from him. But that's truly unfortunate. But the defense comes back, and look at this turnover on downs. The um, <clears throat> Mike Zimmer has a chance to win the game. Fourth and one out of the two-minute warning on Seattle's six-yard line. The three-point makes it an eight-point game. So now Seattle would have to go down and drive for a touchdown and get the two-point conversion. But Mike Zimmer says, we're going to win now. And I can definitely – I mean, I agree with the call. I mean, yeah, you – you can kick it, make it an eight-point game, make it even harder, or you can go and end the fucking game right now. You can get to your offensive line, your running back, your quarterback, you're like, hey, we can end the game right now. We're going to end the game right now. Go end the game right now. But then they don't end the game right now, and then you leave Russell Wilson two minutes, and he goes on a 94-yard methodical drive, and he's the best quarterback in the league, and he's going to the best receiver in the league, DK Metcalf, and he goes to him in the red zone, and he goes to them on this 39-yard pass on this drive. Let's look at this, folks. This is Russell Wilson to DK Metcalf for huge yards. A minute left. Look at him just go on a fourth and ten. They say, fuck the first down. We're going for the touchdown on this one. Four Fourth and ten, Russell Wilson, DK Metcalf. Do you do you want a better duo, quarterback to wide receiver duo with uh, on fourth and ten game on the line? I don't think you do. What a play by both two, and they're not done yet, folks. They are not done yet. Then we get the touchdown drive. Let me pull this up. Then we get the touchdown pass to DK Metcalf once again on fourth and goal. Another fourth down. Clutch conversion by Russell Wilson and DK Metcalf, folks. I know what I'm talking about here. We've been calling it all season. Russell Wilson, one of the top two quarterbacks in the league. DK Metcalf, one of the top receivers in the league. He is the second, or I would put him as number one, Tyree Kill at number two. Here it is, fourth and goal. Russell Wilson from the six-yard line. They're down five. It's do or die time. And what does he do all the time? He usually Do's. He usually does in do or die situation. Goes to DK Metcalf once again, and that's game, game, game time, baby. They go for the two point conversion. They don't get it. Didn't really matter if they did. There was only 15 seconds left on the clock. There's no way the Vikings are going to get down into field goal position. But this choice comes back and bites Mike Zimmer in the butt. And that's why everybody's kind of second guessing that decision because they don't get the two point conversion. The Viking or the Seahawks would have needed that if the Vikings went for that field goal instead of going for it on fourth and one. But I respect the call. You go. You have a chance to win the game. You go and ch you you take the chance to win the game. I don't care. When, whenever it is. So stop stop um, criticizing Mike Zimmer. Um, it's a great call. It's a 50-50 call, and you can't argue either really way against it. He went with it. It's unfortunate. Didn't go his way. Um, but that's what happens on 50-50 calls. They're 50-50 calls for a reason. You're gonna. You're going to win some. You're going to lose some. You're going to break even in the end. But well done to Russell Wilson. Their first kind of, or not even the first. I mean, the Seahawks, they know adversity. They know over overcoming, and they've done it this game. This is kind of like why we liked the Chiefs, because they had that early struggle against the Chargers, that they come back and win it in overtime. Here we go. Really not getting anything. They scored no points in the first half, folks. They were getting shut out, but they come back. They game plan. Um, Pete Carroll's a fantastic head coach. Gets the team ready, and this offense is as best as there is in the league, and you can never count them out. I saw a lot of people on Twitter counting at halftime being like, oh, Seattle's so trash. I'm just like, you got to wait, folks. <laughs> you got to wait because it's going to happen. It's going to happen. So um, Seattle saves their number one spot in our power rankings. I will spoil it. They'll still be number one. Loved what I saw yesterday. It's not going to, you know, every game's not going to be, oh, they're winning by 14 going into the fourth quarter, and then they can just cruise for the rest of the game. This is the NFL, folks. It's any given Sunday. Teams have chances to win. It's how you play an entire, what is it, 48 minutes? No, 60 minutes of football. It's how you play an entire 60 minutes, and Seattle plays the best 60 minutes of football with the best of them. The, um, them, the Chiefs, and probably the Packers, top three, uh, top three teams in the league that play until the final whistle. So that's what we had last Sunday. Great games, um, some great stories, some great narratives, some great redemptions. Love that Houston win. Um, unfortunately, we got some big injuries as well. Dak Prescott, big damn, man, huge injury, unfortunate.
Uh, but tomorrow we've got games to talk about. We'll talk about Monday Night Football tomorrow. We'll um we'll we'll pretty because we have to wait till that Tuesday game to really kind of update the um, power rankings because it's Bills and Titans. They're both in our top ten, so that really is going to make it a little harder. But we'll figure it uh, figure out a way around it. We may do a pre. Yeah, we'll do that. We'll do a a pre end of week five. Top 10, our power rankings. And then if we need to adjust based on what happens on Tuesday, we will adjust. But we will have our power rankings tomorrow. We'll update our cash and trash list for the NFL also tomorrow. And then getting us ready for Wednesday film review. So we will be back um, tomorrow. Unfortunately, we can't talk any more NBA. Truly. Uh, so we'll talk about some stories if they break, some coaching positions, some teams, uh, players switching teams. But we're not going to be reviewing basketball every other day, unfortunate. So, you know, going big on football for the rest of the season. We'll be back tomorrow, noon Eastern, twitch.tv slash takesbyfans. Follow me on Twitter at takesbyfans. It's the best place, to get in contact, best place to get in contact with me and see what we've got going on. I tweet all the time, come out uh, live tweeting. I live tweet the game. So if you're ever interested on what I'm saying, oh, my goodness, I almost forgot. We got our moneymaker for tonight's game. Saints, or not, yeah, Saints. Saints, Chargers, here we go. Saints minus seven, and um, I like it. I don't truly trust the chargers just quite yet on the road we like the saints minus seven gonna get out of that screen so i don't look at the other lines that are going to happen i like to keep them a surprise so we are gonna go chargers or saints minus seven saints are at home they might get michael thomas back i think he's gonna or no he he's not gonna play because he got into an altercation that just broke so they're punishing the saints are punishing Michael Thomas for getting into an altercation with a teammate. It was really, it wasn't even kind of brought up in specifics of what happened, but he got into an argument. He gets uh, benched. He could go, but I liked what this the Saints did last week, finding other ways to win besides just going to Alvin Kamara, running the ball, and then passing to him in the backfield. So they're getting Emmanuel Sanders back into the game, um, which absolutely he's one of the best receivers on the on the team now that Michael Thomas is not playing. But I like them. They're at home once again, a prime time spot. Um, Justin Herbert, they're not opening up the full offense to him. I think so. I can't, I can't, uh, I can't bet on them until I see an entire game of him throwing the ball down the field, not just dink it, dunk, and then two plays that go for forty yard touchdowns because everybody's expecting the dink and dunk. So you catch him by surprise twice. That happens. It happens to the best of them. We just saw it happen with the Steelers. The seventy four yard run play. There was another couple plays that went big too. So we like uh, the Saints here minus seven at home. Alrighty, now that does it for us today. Uh, we'll be back tomorrow talking about Monday Night Football, cash and trash list, power rankings, all tomorrow. Great show. We'll be back tomorrow, noon Eastern, twitch.tv slash takesbyfans, takesbyfans.com slash watch, whichever way you want. Follow me on Twitter at takesbyfans. Alrighty, we're out.